All right, I'm going to jump right in. Uh, a very difficult passage today. So grateful Don gave me this passage from 1 Corinthians 8. And I can't believe I'm about to share this story with you. Uh, this is a story that uh, happened some years ago, and I was at the church building getting ready for services. Uh, my oldest daughter was three years old at the time. Lucy's three years old. And as I'm getting ready for services, Annie, my wife, calls me, and she says, hey, uh, she's okay, but Lucy cut her finger a little bit, and so she got a, a Band-Aid on it. It's one of the cartoon characters that she loves, and she's really excited to show you. I know you're busy, but uh, when you first see her, if you'd make a big deal out of it, I know that'd mean a lot to her. I just love how my wife does that. Gives me kind of the coaching about how to get to on the kid's level. I really appreciated that. I'm like, okay, got it. Good. Okay, so I'm, I'm up and, and doing the welcome, I think, for our church. By the way, which is, this was a church in Chicago, Willow, that Don helped to start. Still a legend there. So here I am in front of our church family there and doing the welcome. I come down off the stairs and my, my three-year-old daughter, Lucy, sweetest little thing, uh, family sitting in the front row there, she jumps off the, the chair and she walks over to me and she holds up her hand and she extends, which finger do you think that had the little... <laughs> no, don't show me, come on. Yes, it was that finger that had the little Band-Aid on it that she was so proud to show her daddy in front of a room about this size, and I was mortified. I was like, that's, that's okay, sweetie. That's okay. She, she doesn't even know. And so it's like pastor's kids, right? Well, guys, I, I, I don't want to offend anyone by sharing that particular story, but I want to use it to highlight a fact that we just got to acknowledge out of the gate here. We all come into the places where we're sitting right now here at Sand Lake, Winter Garden, Alafaya. You're watching at home. We all come into these places with varying levels of conscience sensitivity. Does that make sense? And we come into these places with varying levels of conscience sensitivity, sometimes because of our youthfulness, maybe because we're, we're, we're new in our spiritual journey, maybe we don't know as much doctrine or something, maybe we're in a different season of life or something, but we have different uh, levels of conscience sensitivity. And I'm happy to tell you that when Lucy, my daughter, held up that finger to me in front of our entire church, the elders did not call a meeting, perform church discipline, and excommunicate her. Why? Because she's a three-year-old little girl. She had no idea what that meant. So there was an immaturity there, but also an innocence that came with that immaturity. Does that make sense? And we all come into this space with differing levels of conscience sensitivity. And you know where that needs to matter most, this level of conscience sensitivity? That needs to matter most in areas of life that seem gray or questionable. What I mean by that is, what are gray or questionable areas? Those are, those are issues in our lives or areas of our lives that don't seem to be uh, specifically or directly addressed in the Bible. Like they're not addressed with, with black and white clarity. Um, just then what do you do when those kinds of things happen? Well, let's, let me share some questions that I've fielded as a pastor that kind of give you examples of these, these gray areas. Is it okay to have a little color in my speech, to swear just a little bit? Is that okay? Some of you might have seen there's like a social media <clears throat> hashtag going around that says, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. Is that Okay. Um, another question, am I free to have a drink of alcohol when I'm out? Another question, you guys are getting quieter. Uh, my, spouse, <laughs> my spouse was raised to believe that we shouldn't eat meat on Fridays. Is it wrong for me to sit down next to her eating this? <laughs> now this is my family of upbringing issue. My dad was a really strong Roman Catholic and did not eat meat on Fridays. My mom was a really strong evangelical Protestant, so in our house it was like the Reformation, and, and this would happen from time to time. Is that okay? Is it a flag on the play of my life, here's another one, to watch or maybe even own movies that include crude language, gratuitous violence, or nudity? Is that okay? Is it okay to spend money on a big luxury item that I don't need? Here's another question. If I want to get a tattoo of Don Cousin's face on my shoulder, is that okay? Is that wrong? What do you think? You're, you're afraid to answer. I understand. I was afraid to show it to him, but I'm not, you know. Okay, what if, what if it's a tattoo of something less offensive? Okay? Another question. Another question. Stick with me. You guys are losing you. Should Christians go to Halloween parties? Yes or no, should we? 
There's some Christians that would say, no way, that's celebrating death and darkness. And there are other Christians that would say, oh, come on, we're just having fun. So should we? Is it a fair ball or a foul ball if I skip church service to attend a sports event? Another one, is it okay to play video games that showcase violence or crime? When our kids were younger and started playing video games, we're like, you know, I'm not super comfortable with you playing Call of Duty, like killing people and blood splattering. And, and they're like, well, what about Halo? I'm like, well, what are you killing that? And they're like, aliens. I'm like, all right, that's fine. And I don't, I don't know if that was the right coaching or not, but is it, was that okay? Is it okay if I bet on a sports event? What if I win and I tithe off that? Seriously have gotten that question, okay? It's a gray area. Is it okay to binge watch TV shows? How about TV MA, like mature audience only shows? Is that okay? Is it okay to watch or listen to popular music that pushes values that are counter to my kingdom values as a disciple of Christ? Last one here. When the speed limit is 35... Is it okay to go 41 miles an hour? Nobody wants to answer that. I understand that. What if you're late for a church service? (laughs) Friends, what do you do when the Bible doesn't give direct instruction on things like speed limits, Netflix, video games, or Halloween parties? Well, the community church of Corinth, which was filled with bouncing baby believers, they sent Paul something like a Dear Abby letter that was filled with questions like these. And and Paul responded to them. He wrote back to them, and he dealt with a lot of the problems that they were having in their church family. But he also answered a bunch of the questions that they sent him in their letter. And we come today to chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians, where Paul answers the question, is it okay to eat meat sacrificed to idols? And you might wonder, as you hear that question, what in the world does this have to do with us? Does this apply to us in any way whatsoever? Oh, yes, it does. Because in this, God gives us wisdom, four insights, as a matter of fact, into how to handle gray areas in our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 1. I encourage you to look it up on your Bible or on your phone. Keep it open on your lap as we go through this message. Here we go. Now about food sacrificed to idols. We know that we all possess knowledge. But knowledge puffs up, while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know, but whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us... There is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to, and this literally means to be intimately familiar with, they're so intimately familiar with idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a God. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We're no worse if we do eat, no better if we don't. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. Now, perfectly clear, right? Now, as we hear that, it might help to also hear some context, some historical context behind this. You need to know that in first century Corinth, nearly every major area of life came attached with an associated god or deity or goddess or or, or idol. If sex was your thing, something you were worried about, there was a god for that. And her name was Aphrodite. If marriage was your thing, there was a God for that. If business was your thing, there was a God for that. If it was sports or travel or commerce or war or illness, there was a God for that. So idolatry was a daily part of life. Well over a dozen temples throughout the first century city of Corinth. 
You need to know that. Now, also, this culture believed, and this is this was crazy, blew my mind when I learned this. Didn't know this until I studied this just a couple weeks back. Also, this culture believed that evil spirits constantly tried to invade human beings and most often did that by attaching themselves to meat before it was eaten. And the only way to remove the spirits from the meat was to offer it as a sacrifice to a god or to that god's idol, which would allegedly earn the favor of the god and cleanse the meat. And so people in this culture wanted meat sacrificed to gods or sacrificed to idols. Beyond that, one more piece of cultural background here that's important to know. It was also an extremely common social practice to have meals in temples. As a matter of fact, most of the temples, archaeology shows us, actually had dining rooms that were fitted around these temples that surrounded the outer ring of them. Dining rooms for festivals and celebrations and weddings where where people would eat meat that had been sacrificed to those idols. But finally, even most of the meat in the market came from these temple sacrifices. I like, couldn't avoid it. So I want you to journey back with me, try to put ourselves in their sandals for a second. Let's say it's, it's AD 53, okay? It's AD 53 in Corinth, and, and you're there. Cool thing about this is there is this guy named Paul who actually led you to Jesus three years ago. You trusted in Jesus, and you became a Christian. But your niece, who is not yet a believer, is getting married. And, and she just invited you to her wedding. And the wedding is going to be held along with the reception at this amazing temple, this venue called Aphrodite's Temple. This is everybody wanted to have their weddings here. 2,000 feet above the seafloor, looked out over the water. It's breathtakingly beautiful, breathtaking venue. But you need to know that when you go there, oh, for sure, by the way, you are absolutely going to be offered meat, offered to Aphrodite. So what do you do? You love your niece. Well, what do you do? Do you go and eat the meat? I mean, because, come on, you don't even believe that Aphrodite is real anymore. So you can eat the meat, right? Or do you go and you refuse to eat the meat because you're also well aware that some younger new believers in Jesus will be there who believe that eating meat offered to idols is actually wrong. It's actually sinful. And so if you do that, if you eat this meat in front of them, you're going to actually tempt them into sin or you're going to, at the very least, offend them. Because they think that if they eat this meat offered to Aphrodite, they're going to get defiled. But if you refuse to eat the meat offered to Aphrodite, you're going to risk for sure offending your niece and their family and other friends of people that are there. So this, this, you just make an excuse not to go? I'm doing my hair that day? What do you do? This is quite a pickle, right? And this is the kind of thing that people are experiencing. And all the while, you who, who got led to the Lord by, by Paul, you got this voice of him echoing in your mind. You just can't get rid of this question that he would always ask you. And he would say this, as a follower of Jesus, are you influencing the culture or is the culture influencing you? And it just ricochets around in your mind. As a follower of Jesus, are you influencing the culture or is it influencing you? It just keeps going around and around like a fly buzzing in your mind. And what you realize as you think about this That believers in first century Corinth, they they found it a daily challenge to not get sucked back into their former pagan practices, especially when their non-believing friends and family are still fully immersed in that idol-worshiping culture. So what do you do? Well, Paul gives us four things to consider, four things to consider to help us to navigate gray or questionable areas of life. First one is this. When something's gray, check your attitude. When something's gray, check your attitude. He goes through this in verses one through three. Paul starts off by saying, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. It's almost poetic, isn't it? But you need to understand, Paul is not dissing knowledge here. Paul would never do that. He's dissing having a prideful attitude about the knowledge that we have. He wants us to understand knowledge is essential, but it's not enough. You need something else. You also need love. Love as this is the driving force of how you apply your knowledge. He'd want us to understand that love, well stewarded, will always be wielded with love. Knowledge, well stewarded, will always be wielded with love for God and for other people. And this is important to emphasize since more mature Christians who know Scripture well can be tempted to be puffed up or to be prideful about that knowledge when dealing with younger, less mature Christians. I went to a seminary in Texas, and when I was over in, in that culture, 
uh, uh, one of the church that we were part of while learning about what it means to follow God and actually even like help to lead a church and, uh, uh, was a fascinating kind of culture. And I remember having questions sometimes like when we were in, in class in this, this church and I'd raise my hand and ask a, a question and the teacher would respond by saying, well, bless your heart and then respond. Now, I, got, I, I didn't feel like my heart was being blessed when, when they said that. I felt like kind of an idiot as a matter of fact. Well, older believers can be stronger in their faith than younger, less mature believers who are therefore weaker in their faith and can tend toward legalistic views of Christian life. So a good question to ask is, is your attitude puffing up yourself? Because you think, well, I know better. Or is it building up the ones that your actions affect? Because you love them. So check your attitude. Paul echoes this in 1 Corinthians 13. When he says this, just a few verses, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm just a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body the hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is really important. But so is knowledge. Look what he says in Philippians 1.9. I pray that your love may abound more and more in what? In knowledge. So you need both. Paul's help us understand we need both. The greater your knowledge, though, the greater your love should be. The greater your knowledge becomes, the greater our love should become. I don't know who's first said this, but I hear it all the time, and it's, it's really solid. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's good, right? It's really true. Friends, be so careful here at Discovery Church. Let's be so, so careful that in growing in our understanding of the principles of truth, we're also growing in our practice of grace. Because love is the real test of maturity, not doctrinal IQ, not Bible trivia. The principle out of these first few verses is this. Your knowledge must be balanced by love for others. Quick illustration of this would, out of Jesus' life would be how Jesus would deal with the Pharisees. Who were the people that drove Jesus battiest more than anybody else? The people that would drive Jesus nuts when he walked this earth were the Pharisees, were the religious leaders. Because he's basically constantly having to ask them, how is it possible that you have so much knowledge but so little love? It actually made Jesus angry. So Paul wants us to understand here, when something's gray, Check your attitude. Your knowledge must be balanced by love for others. Then in verses four through the beginning of seven, Paul gives us another insight. This is the second one. When something's gray, check your brothers and sisters' perspective. Check their perspective. Don't just check your attitude. Check their perspective. In other words, what do they know about whatever it is that you're considering doing? For instance, Paul declares an idol is nothing at all in verse four. An idol, in other words, is it's man-made, it's lifeless, it's powerless. And we see this all throughout Scripture. Psalm 115 says this, Their idols are silver and gold, made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak. They have eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear. They have noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel. They, they have feet but they can't walk. See, Paul acknowledges the witness across Scripture. It's loud and clear. There is only one true God, and that's Jesus Christ, the creator and the sustainer of all things. That's what he says in verse 6. And so that really does clarify whether a person can, in fact, be defiled by eating meat offered to idols. The answer is no. Because since the idols are powerless, they are powerless to contaminate the meat. So on your own, you have the freedom to eat meat offered to idols. But, but, this is so critical, in the beginning of verse 7, uh, 7a, the very first half of it, he says your freedom isn't the only thing to consider. You also need to realize, what's he say? Not everyone possesses this knowledge. So their perspective remains more limited than yours. And so therefore, love demands that you also consider your brother's and your sister's perspective when deciding how to act. In other words, not just your knowledge, but also your freedom must be balanced by love for others. Your freedom must be balanced by love for others. My wife, Annie, grew up in a home where uh, before Easter, this period called Lent, uh, sometimes they would give something up. Uh, to help them to focus on what's coming in Easter. It's just 
Really cool idea. It's not in the Bible. You don't have to do it, but it's something that they would practice and she practiced for, for years. And so she's given up something for Lent this year and she asked me if I wanted to participate. I didn't really want to participate, but I said, you know what? I think I'm going to give up my morning coffee. Now you need to understand about me. I love me some bold coffee in the morning. So the very first day of Lent, when, when I get up and, and I, I, I substitute my, my nice bold coffee for green, with green tea, as soon as it touched my lips, I realized that I had made a rash decision. <laughs> this was a very poor commitment, Marcus. I'm thinking to myself, didn't want to keep doing it for the next 40 days, but anyway, Annie, she gets this, this burden, this struggle that I'm going through, and she sends me this meme, which is hilarious. I wanted to share. She said, did you know, I'm curious if you guys know this, did you know that by replacing your morning coffee with green tea, you can lose 87% of what little joy is left in your life. <laughs> it's for sure. Definitely. I, I'm growing. I'm growing though. So, so, okay. But where Paul's going, you guys focus. Okay, come on, focus. Where, where Paul's going with this is here. Because you love your brother or sister in Christ, you're careful to take into account how she or he, as a younger or less mature, and in that sense, a weaker believer, may view what you're considering doing. You realize that they haven't yet developed a deep perspective of what their freedoms are in Christ and the implications of those freedoms. And so seeing that, you then choose not to exercise your freedom if they don't yet realize or have the perspective that they too have that freedom. Does that make sense? That's what we're talking about here. So you let your love balance or you let your love temper or you let your love limit your freedom. Ready for the next guiding insight? Here it is, number three. When something's gray... Check your brother's and sister's conscience. So when something's great, check your attitude. Check your brother's and sister's perspective. But also check your brother's and sister's conscience. And this is verses 7 through 11. He talks about this. Now, what's a conscience? He says it three times in the three verses here. Weak conscience, weak conscience, weak conscience. What, what, what's a conscience? First thing that comes to mind for me, I don't know if you're this way, is I remember when I was a little kid, I saw this, this Disney cartoon, Pinocchio, you remember, where this, this wooden uh, what, what, puppet comes to life and he becomes a real boy, you remember when that happens? And what happens when he becomes a real boy? Something shows up. His conscience, it's a bug. You remember the insect? Who remembers the name of Pinocchio's conscience? Jiminy Cricket. Is Jiminy Cricket a conscience? I would be warped if that's the, the, the lesson that I learned from culture about what our conscience is. Well, what about this? Uh, another way that, con uh, that culture dictates or defines what a conscience is, you see this image of like a, an angel on your shoulder and, or a demon on this one and, and they're whispering in your ear. Is that, is that a conscience? Is, is a conscience your gut? What's your gut tell you? Follow your gut. Is that conscience? Or is it a moral compass? Maybe that's getting a little bit closer to what a conscience is. Well, conscience refers to our moral consciousness. And it's actually a God-given capacity that every person possesses as being made in the image of God. Every person. It's, it's kind of an inner judge or a moral referee that bears witness to God's moral law in our hearts if our thoughts or actions are God-honoring or not. And when that happens, it's commending us when we do right and even condemning us when we do wrong. It's from Romans 2, Romans 9. And this helps us to understand, this is why you never want to violate your own conscience. Just don't ever do it. If your conscience is telling you don't do something, don't, don't do it, don't say it, don't do it. But what does scripture tell us about our conscience? Well, the very moment we place our faith in Christ, our conscience is cleansed, we're told. Hebrews 9 and 10. This is one of the many blessings of our, our new birth, our regeneration with the Spirit of God in us. Another thing is that God's indwelling spirit then enhances or confirms our conscience. That's from Romans 9. We're called to keep a good or a, a clear conscience to best express our love and our sincerity of faith. And that's from 1 Timothy 1. Uh, repeated unconfessed sin results in a defiled conscience. That's from Titus 1. A defiled conscience can become a seared conscience when, uh, which grows callous and no longer really responds to the conviction of sin. That's from 1 Timothy 4. And with God's help, we're to strive to keep our conscience free of offense of God or man. And that's from Acts 24, 16. But our passage today from 1 Corinthians 8, it tells us something else, even more important, really critically important for us to understand about conscience in the context of what we're talking about today. And that is this that a new or untaught Christian will have a weak conscience 
when compared to a more mature, stronger Christian who is well-versed from the teachings of God's word. So it's not a diss to them. It's just saying, hey, you're a baby believer. Believer, you're, you're growing. So a new or untaught Christian will have a, a weaker conscience than an older, stronger Christian. That means that a young or untaught Christian with a weak conscience may also be easily defiled, verse 7, wounded, verse 12, and offended, verse 13. And that word offended that you see in verse 13, you can, you can, you can write that down, is, is a Greek word, skandalizo, and it, it basically means to set a snare out, to trap someone, to force them to stumble. It's where we get our word for scandal from. And so older, stronger Christians must lovingly defer to and show great care when dealing with younger, less mature believers. It's just a loving thing to do. But please notice that the older defers to the younger, the more mature defers to the less mature, not to coddle or pamper them, but to encourage him or her to mature and grow. So in this way, the older believer builds up, or another word we could use for that is disciples, the younger believer. So a certain, to a certain degree here, a metaphor that really helped me to understand this passage, uh, to a certain degree here, Paul is talking about just basically baby-proofing the church. That's what he's talking about. Anybody have a new baby at home? Winter Garden, LFA, anybody have a new baby? How about here, Sand Lake? No, you guys are mostly older, right? No, I know some of you have babies. I saw some hands, yeah. Well, if you have a new baby in your home, then you go through a process where you baby-proof your house. What's that mean? Like when we had babies, we would put little foam pads on hard corners of things because babies are beautiful, but they're dumb, right? And so they'll walk over to something and just fall right into the corner, right? Uh, so you'll put plastic plugs in the electric outlets because babies are unwise, right? They'll take forks and put them into the electric. If you're like my kids, maybe you're not. You guys are looking at me like you have perfect children, which is probably true. But uh, maybe you put fences at the tops of your stairs. Uh, at the end of the day, you put your kid in something that looks like a little prison cell, which we call cribs. Why? Because you don't want them crawling out at night, right? You put away the chemicals that look like Kool-Aid. Why? So they don't drink the chemicals that could kill them, right? Because you love your baby, you might even put little safety locks in the cabinets and on the doors. In our house, um, we grew up in a, um, uh, a really cool area, and, and uh, our, our, three, our three kids that grew up uh, with us uh, uh, that were born in Virginia Beach, one, one of our kids, he was actually our firstborn son, his name was George, and we called him all afterburner and no rudder. We called him this because where we grew up was uh, in Virginia Beach where there were fighter jets flying over us all the time, and it was so cool. And we realized, that's like George. He's all afterburner and no rudder. It's like all speed and no direction. Like, he's just ricocheting around. And so as a baby, we had to like put bubble wrap on everything in the house. And there was even this one time when he was even a young boy. He's having these bad dreams. And, and I'd hear him whimpering and whatnot and I, or crying out. So I'd kind of come over to help him. And as I'm walking out of our bedroom, down the hallway to his room, I look down the stairs. And as I look down the stairs, I see the front door. And it's open. And George is standing outside the house. He sees me, screams, and starts running down the street, right in the middle of the street. We never saw him after that. But I... <laughs> I ran after him, of course, saved his life. I remind him that frequently. And, but the point is, we had to baby-proof our house. You know what we did after that? We put little slide bolts at the very tops of all the doors in the house so George couldn't get out of the house in the middle of the night. Guys, when Paul addresses how to handle meat sacrificed to idols around baby believers, he's baby-proofing the church. He's asking older, more mature disciples with stronger consciences who are less at risk from the pagan practices around them to lovingly avoid those practices so as not to lead the baby disciples into danger since their consciences were weak and still developing. Does that make sense? So Paul's saying here, when something's gray, check your brother's or sister's conscience. Now, he offers one last insight, and it's huge. Number four, when something's gray, check your impact. This comes out of verses 12 to 13. Check your impact. Before you act in a certain way, consider the potential impact your actions will have on the weaker brothers and sisters and on Christ himself. This is important. Verse 12, when you sin against them in this way, eating meat offered to idols, and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Paul just kind of goes for the jugular here, doesn't he? He's not messing around with this. The word wound means to strike or to beat up to strike or to beat up. And he's saying that when we exercise our freedom to do something without taking into account the potential impact on a weaker Christian, it's not only like beating them, 
It's like beating Jesus. Because sinning against them is sinning against Jesus. Now, this is really important because Paul knew exactly what he was talking about here. Remember when we started this series several months ago and we talked about how actually Saul came to Christ and then we call him Paul since then, which is just basically his Greek name for that, for his name. Well, remember in Acts chapter 9 when Jesus confronts him, stops him in his tracks when he's riding on the road to Damascus to persecute believers, to to persecute more and more Christians? Jesus stops him in his tracks and asks him a critical question. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He didn't say, why are you persecuting my believers? He said, why are you persecuting me? So Paul learned this lesson the second Jesus saved him. He learned that to mess with Christians is to mess with Christ. He, He learned that whatever we do to one another... We do to Jesus himself, which is why in chapter 12, later, 1 Corinthians 12, 27, he says, now you are the body of Christ. So another reason you don't want to offend a brother or sister is because if you do, you're also offending Jesus Christ. And so listen how Paul concludes in verse 13. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. I mean, so you got to check this out. So Paul goes... I would rather eat broccoli for the rest of my life and never have a bite of beef again if it means not offending Christ. Hashtag vegetarians for Jesus. That's what he's basically saying here. Now that is true love, right? So this is what Paul's saying. So what's the bottom line truth of this passage? Complicated passage, right? Simple bottom line truth. And here it is. Love limits liberty. Love limits liberty. We want this to be big, like a headline in a newspaper, because this is good news in your life. Love limits liberty. We don't want us to forget this. Love limits liberty. So as we're getting ready to land the plane here, just quick exam time. And I want to encourage you, shout your answer. Wherever you are, shout your answer. First question, and it's a yes or no response, okay, is are we free in Christ? Yes. Yes, we are free in Christ. If the sun sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. It's all over the place in scripture. Here's the second question. Does our freedom mean that we can do whatever we want? Yes or no? No. You guys are so much smarter than the 9 a.m. They struggled with that. That's right. Are we free? Yes. Does that mean we can do whatever we want? No. Now let's see if you can get this. one. Last question. Most important question in this. What limits our freedom? That's what happened at the 11 2. Am I not a good teacher? I don't know what's happening. No, it's, the answer is love. Are we free? Yes. Does that mean we can do whatever we want? No. So what limits our freedom? Love. Love limits liberty. Is it still, it's still there. Love limits <laughs> liberty. Guys, being free in Christ means taking into consideration how our actions affect other believers and out of love for them, deliberately tempering or balancing or limiting our freedom for their sake. When we live this way, when when stronger Christians have a building up impact on weaker Christians who are then edified and strengthened or grown and in such a way that they too will one day be able to disciple other less mature believers themselves, God's honored. The church grows because love builds up. And so our personal behavior is not to be primarily dictated by what we know or what we think our rights are or our freedoms, but instead by love for those who who are within the new community. Love limits liberty. Everything we do that affects relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ should be primarily motivated by our love for them. In other words, let your love for your brothers and sisters in Christ limit your liberty. Not to do so is a sin not just against them, but also against Jesus himself. So when something's gray or questionable, check your attitude, for sure. Check your brothers and sisters' perspective, absolutely. Check your brothers and sisters' conscience, yeah. But also check your potential impact. Now, as we go through that and you think to yourself, man, Marcus, I I can't memorize four principles from 1 Corinthians 8. How in the world am I gonna handle a life situation the next time a gray area comes and hits me straight in the face? Well, I wanna give you a quick way to do this a quick way to know how your love should limit your liberty before we finish up. And that's three questions for questionable areas. Three questions for questionable areas. And those questions are, K, 
can I, should I, and will I? When you ask the question, can I, this deals with your knowledge and your freedom. Can I? Your knowledge and your freedom. You're asking basically the question, is there any biblical direction to this? And if so, you want to follow it. 2 Timothy 3, 16 says, all scripture is God-breathed and useful. So if God's word is clear on something, you want to obey that. So let's take an example that we talked about from the beginning. Is it okay? Can I cuss a little? Can I? Can I cuss a little? Well, what does scripture have to say about that? Ephesians 4, 29, pretty clear here. Let no, and if we had to say that was a percentage, it would probably be 0%, right? Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only maybe 100%, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So can I cuss a little? No. The answer would be no from Scripture, right? Can I? No. All right, I'm going to really meddle now. I'm going to keep going with this. Can I speed? Some of you are getting, can we lock the doors, please? Some of you, can I speed? <laughs> what does Scripture have to say about this? Romans 13 says, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. And then if, in case I was unclear, 1 Peter 2, 13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men. So if the authorities instituted and established by God post a speed limit, does that limit your freedom to speed? Yes or no, Discovery Church? Yes, I know you're saying it begrudgingly, I get it from Chicago. I get that. It's hard. Can I speed? Nope. But I can get up and leave earlier, right? Okay, so just a little, some of you think, can I? If something goes against the teaching of God's word, you are not free to do it. And if you do, you're violating your conscience, and that's a sin. However, if it does not go against the teaching of God's word, then you may be free to do it. Before you do, though, you need to ask the next question, which is, should I? I just can't I if I know, you know what, there's teaching in here, and so I have a freedom. Well, now should I? And this is dealing with your conscience, not just yours, but your brother or sister's. So you're asking questions in this realm, like, is it helpful or useful or beneficial for me and for you? You're, you're asking questions like, you know, will this make me and you built up more mature, stronger in Christ? 1 Corinthians 10, 23. Does this set a good example for other believers? Would doing this glorify God? Would, would it involve me obeying him and, and honoring him? Or would, would it cause you to stumble? Right? This 1 Corinthians 8, Romans 14, 21. I, I want to use the example of alcohol with this. I asked at the beginning of the message, can I have a drink when I'm out with my friends? And I think this is probably the clearest gray area that we're wrestling with. Some of these gray areas that, I'm, that we're mentioning already are only gray because we've allowed the culture to so influence us as the church. Some of them, however, are gray. Can I drink alcohol? Well, Scripture clearly teaches drinking in moderation, meaning without excess, is permitted. It's permitted in Scripture. Luke 2, Jesus' very first miracle was creating the best wine ever. So drinking in moderation without excess is permitted, but drunkenness is prohibited. Ephesians 5, 18, do not get drunk, which in Greek means do not get drunk. Okay, just really... <laughs> but also... But also, you need to take another's conscience into loving consideration, meaning, are they weak? 1 Corinthians 8, Romans 14, 21. So should I have a drink in public, yes or no? It depends. It depends. There might be somebody that you're with or who's near you, you don't know, who's wrestled with alcohol as an addiction. Or they're a brand new believer and they're like, you know what? No, I don't want to do a Bud Light because I think if I do that, I'm going to be sinning. And so it depends should I have a drink in public? It depends. So what do you do? You be wise. Should you? Be wise. Maybe, in this instance, you're going to let your love limit your liberty if there's another brother or sister around you. Third question you're going to ask is, will I? So can I? Should I? But then will I? And this is where push comes to shove here. This involves your love for others and for Jesus. Would it be more loving for me to limit my liberty here for the sake of another and for the sake of Jesus? It's just 1 Corinthians 8, right? Is this something that Jesus himself would do if he were in my shoes? Because he is? 1 John 2, 6, whoever claims to live in him must also live as Jesus did. Galatians 2, 20, Christ lives in me. Another question, if I do this, am I influencing culture or is culture influencing me? 
Can I just be vulnerable and tell you that of all the areas of my life where I felt the most in conviction since we've been going through uh, this book, in fact, since I started researching it for Don and our teaching team, has actually been around the area of what I watch, what our family watches, movies, TVs. And I'm gonna share something that's making you super uncomfortable. Probably, maybe not. You guys are probably further than I am in this area, but, but this, this is probably important for you to be able to understand about us. I, I found that as our kids were getting older, we were starting to, to, to watch TV shows or movies that would require us to fast forward like different things, different scenes that had like bad language or, or nudity or violence. So we're fast forwarding more. And it's so accessible now, right? With like all these different apps, you can watch stuff, whatever you want in your house. And I just realized we're fast forwarding more like what's kind of starting to wonder, well, why are we watching this? And what I realized was that what we watch is one of the most subtle ways I think culture has been influencing our family. I'm just talking about our family here. Annie actually brought this to my attention. She said something to the effect of, is it loving to exercise this freedom with our kids around? And, and so we talked about it. We went through these three questions. Can I? Should I? Will I? And the answer for us is, no, we won't anymore. And so we had to wrestle through, is any form of entertainment? I mean, first of all, let's categorize this where it needs to be categorized. It's not a life or death thing. This is entertainment. Is any form of entertainment really worth it if it brings an influence into our home that's counter to Christ's DNA in us? And so for the Bishki tribe, we're adjusting what we watch. Psalm 101.3 is great on this. I'll set no worthless thing before my eyes. Annie and I don't want to do that for our kids. And so now, this is kind of crazy, a couple days ago, we started watching the Ten Commandments, like the 800-year-old version, and we're enjoying it. And there's not one time where I'm like, oh, we better fast forward. Moses is about to take out the Uzi and take out Pharaoh and his army. <laughs> or Moses and Nefertiti are about to go at it. Let's fast forward. No, I don't have to do that. Why? Because it's appropriate. My kids, and, and, and I'll say, we even watched like Little House on the Prairie, and I Love Lucy, and The Chosen. And the funny thing is, I actually, for a split second, only a split second, I worried about sharing that with my new church family because I thought, I just don't want you guys to think I'm a dork. But then you know what? I thought, that's all right. You can think whatever you want about me and my family because for Annie and I, we want to serve the Lord. And for us in this, and our conscience and our knowledge and our freedom and our love for our kids, we're letting our love for our children limit our liberty in that. You do what you want with that. Think that through, though. But guys, navigating gray areas well is so important. Why does this matter so much? Jesus gave us a clear guidance to this. Again, when Pharisees were pushing him, Mark 12, 30 and 31, like, what's the greatest commandment, Jesus? He's like, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Loving God and loving others is a ball game. It's why we're talking about this. So I've given you four principles, three questions. Last thing we're going to do before we pray, just super briefly, one person. Did you know Jesus let his love limit his liberty? Isn't that crazy to think about? When he put on flesh, he gave up all of his rights as God. He did all of his rights, all his glory and power and safety and honor, all the worship of heaven. He gave all that up. When Jesus became a man, he limited his freedom. You ever think about that? He got tired. He got hungry. He, Jesus got thirsty. Jesus got winded going up a mountain. Jesus got sweaty. Jesus got his legs uh, scraped by thorns. Jesus got bit by mosquitoes. Jesus even got accused. He even got abused. Jesus even got murdered. The Son of God was murdered. And you got to ask yourself, why would he limit his liberty like that? Why? Why would he do it? Because of his love for you. Because of his love for you. Because of his love for you and for me and for us. That's why Jesus limited his own freedoms. It's out of his love for us. And all we're saying today is this. If your relationships with one another in those relationships with one another, brothers and sisters in Christ, have the same mindset or attitude as Christ Jesus. Discovery Church, do we want to be like Jesus? Yeah, we do. Then let's let our love for one another limit our liberty. If we did that, can you imagine the influence of such a church on the culture around us? 
Now let's have a word of prayer together. I wanna ask you to bow your head with me. And as is our custom here, do some business with God in this moment, just you. What's something specific God is trying to tell you as we've learned this lesson? And what does he want you to do about it with him and in his strength? We just talk to him about that for a few moments. God, we really do. We, we thank you for the gift of this first letter to the Corinthians. Sometimes it's tough stuff to hear, but we hear you. Our calling in Christ demands that we not just think about ourselves and whether we can do something, but also about others and whether we should do something. So now with this truth planted in our hearts, may we leave this place to go and be the church, your people, Jesus, just like you. Let us be driven by loving consideration of how our actions affect the well-being of others. Even in the gray areas, out of love for you and others, would you empower us to let love limit our own liberties for the sake of others and for Christ's sake, we pray. If you agree with this prayer, would you say amen? Amen.